There we go. Uh, so Morton shared such great information last year um, that we wanted to have him back to go through um, a lot of his information. He's got great economic information on adding a small grain um, into your rotation, or for a lot of you, back into a rotation. So with that, I'll let him introduce himself. Smarter than the mic. I don't even know. That. <laughs> Great start. Um, so yeah, my name is Martin Larson. I'm from South uh, Southern Southeast Minnesota. So I'm actually right outside of Rochester. So I'm sure most of you are familiar where that is. Um, are most of you in in Mitchell County, surrounding area, north? North, Northeast Iowa. And who was here last year? Yeah, it was a blizzard last year. I guess it was later in February. Um, and now it's April 1st. Um, so, uh, no, wait a minute. It's February 5th or 6th. Uh, so, I, I'm predominantly a cash grain farmer. I farm uh, just under 1,200 acres now. Um, I also work for Olmsted County Soil and Water Conservation District, so I also kind of have, you know, that cost share government uh, perspective from, from uh, uh, to agriculture. Um, my my presentation and uh, information that I'm going to give on economics will not include the cost share part, so just keep that in mind. I've omitted it because. I believe in this and it can stand on its own two feet. So just when we go through economics and costs, um, that cost here is to sweeten the pot and to hedge some of the risk. Um, so I can get into that later. So this is uh, my place. Uh, it's a little rolling. I do have problems with soil erosion. I did um, and still do even some places. Uh, but uh, if conventional farming, uh, led to a lot of soil erosion for me, which was part of the reason that I shifted into no-till and really uh, looked for a third crop to put on the farm to break up the rotation, to include in a full, full no-till system. So even the small grains are raised in a full no-till system. Uh, my dad and uncle pretty much have retired. They still do a little bit of work. Um, but it's pretty much my 12-year-old son and I now. Um, so if you, oh, I think I lost my microphone. Should I try the other one? I'm going to speak up for a little bit while he gets that figured out. Okay. Um, so I got a lot to do between my county job, having a son, trying to enjoy some time off. Um, so I looked into this three, three crop rotation for more than one reason. Uh, diversity comes in more than one way for a three crop rotation. And that's diversity in economics, diversity uh, on the buying side and the selling side. So that's buying our inputs and selling our products on the farm. And then the weather variability. Thank you. Because our farms are exposed to our growing season and the limited growing season that it is. And whether that's too much rain or not enough, I'll get into that a little bit. So that uh, diversity on weather and climate was important to me as well. So it's a system that allows me to grow a substantial legume cover crop. And I'll get into how that affects my uh, bottom line in agronomics. It brings up my two crop rotation. So I get some rotational effect and in increasing yields on the corn and soybean side. And it spreads the workload when working alone, because I'm the guy that combines a load in the fall, combine sits, truck goes to town or to the bin site, and back out to the field. And it's growing food. And 
And I had a uh, farmer text me a few weeks ago, and he just started delivering his oats that he grew last year. And I could tell he was hooked because he had the same amount of, of excitement about his high test weight, low thins, good quality result at the mill and how that makes you feel because you know you grow corn and soybeans and yeah a good nice sample at the ethanol plant is important but there's something to growing food and growing quality food again so a little bit on weather and exposure to drought uh, because that was the big topic coming out of last year and still is today so this is June 20th, 2023, and that's our drought exposure. So we were getting into it in June, actually a little before that. This is July 25th. Now it's really starting to grow. So see this spot right there? That's pretty much 90% of my acres in a D3 drought by July 25th. And by August 22nd, we had uh, some, actually some D4 creep in into September. It wasn't quite there yet in August. So let's just back up. What crop is establishing the majority of its yield on June 20th? What crop is establishing the majority of its yield on July 25th? And then again in August. Any, any guesses? It's a loaded question. Land that you know. Old growers should know. Um, so June 20th would be grain fill period on our oats. July 25th, probably after tassel, grain fill period on corn. And we're still trying to make our top end yield on soybeans in August. So June, July, August. My oats out yielded most of my corn this year due to the increasing drought. So what crop did not have a crop insurance claim on my farm? That was the oats. The, others two, the other two had substantial crop insurance claims. So I'm limiting my exposure and risk to weather variability. Uh, a little bit more on that. Uh, this is Lamberton, Minnesota, and soil moisture availability. Um, this is historic data. So each line is another year, and I apologize, these are pretty small screens and a lot of data on them. But I just want to point out that this is uh, July 15th to October 15th right here. So this is our, the beginning of our growing season. And this is the end of our growing season in Minnesota and Northern Iowa. This blue line right here is 2021. The red line, I believe that's red, I'm a little color deficient. Um, it has squares on it. Uh, that's 2023. And this line right here is 2022. So this isn't the first year that we've had very dry August in Minnesota. And our soybean yields, in some cases corn, have been reflective of that. This is just 2023, so see how far below average we were? This is the historical data on the black line. A little bit on markets. I just have one slide on markets. This is uh, the five-year corn market. And I think we should all be familiar with this, and that's why I don't want to harp on it too much. You can see what's happened in the last year and a half on the corn prices. We know where we're at on input prices. Last year, they were uh, historically high, especially uh, nitrogen costs. And I'll get into how that's important in a little bit. Uh, but we still are on the downside of the corn market right at this time. And I would argue we're on the upside of input costs. So we have a lot of risk in our corn this year. And if you've done a break even sheet, you can kind of, you'll see that. And what just started this month, price establishment for revenue insurance on 
on corn and soybeans. So price discovery happened, starts this month, and we're starting out on the low side. Because look at where we were last year. And because we had, I had revenue claims last year and production claims, it came out okay with that crop insurance. But this year we are going into a much different picture on revenue insurance for corn and soybeans. So it's a risky year on corn and soybeans. This was a few years ago. Uh, that was uh, a smaller drill and a smaller tractor. <laughs> and uh, I think that year I pulled that drill over about 450 acres uh, for myself and the neighbors. So the thing about growing oats is to start early. And I was warned by Dean, not this early. <laughs> so yes, it may feel like we should go out and plant oats today or tomorrow because this is the weather on average that I will start doing it. So if this was April 1st, as the joke I made to begin this, I would be out there doing this um, in conditions like we have today, where in the evenings you get frost and in the day you have mud. That you punch that, those oats through that frost layer, your drill stays relatively clean and put the oats down and, and get some soil cover on them. So I'm a full no-till system. So you can see I have a lot of residue. And as long as you are not embedding those oats into that residue, carry on. And you're keeping your drill relatively clean. You're not freezing it up. Something you want to be aware of is yes, you can freeze it up at night and your openers will stop turning. It's just something to keep an eye on. Because anytime you're working at night, uh, you, you can't see as well. But that is to get acres covered as early as possible. I plant at four bushels, which seems like a lot, but what I'm aiming for is 1.3 million live plants. So we have our germ rate, which is somewhere over 90% usually. And then we have our seeding loss. So not every seed gets placed 100% accurately with a grain drill. So we need to do that math to make sure that we have 1.3 million live plants in the end. Our heavy test weight oats will have less seeds per pound than light test weight oats. So the test weight of the seed that we're actually putting out there kind of comes into play, but the most accurate way to determine what your seeds per pound are is to have a seed count done or do it yourself. You do not need to count out 12,000 seeds, which would be about where you're going to end up at one pound. Use a postage scale or a food scale and just count out enough that you can get a good represent, representative sample and get a few ounces on that scale and then do the math. Uh, this is about May 10th a little before that, a few years ago, so it was a little on the late side. I have seen oats up like this, you know, in April, obviously, but a couple years ago I was a little late seeding. The window didn't work out as well. I'll top dress my nitrogen fertilizer. I was doing it dry in these years. Uh, this year I'll, I'll stream it down, dilute it with water. So I'll use a liquid, like a 32%, and dilute it, and stream it down, and top dress it. I like it a little later once the oats are up, not on the early side. I'll set up, so I'll spray and apply fertilizer in the same tracks. So I'll kind of set up a tram like that. This is what it looks like in June. That's my son a few years ago. About this time is, a little before this is ideal for, for the first application of fungicide and when I spray for weeds. So I'll use MCPA to spray for weeds because I want to keep my legume clover, uh, clover alive underneath. So MCPA, you can start out as low as a third of a pint and go as high as three quarters of a pint. Some folks use Buctrol, others use 2,4-D. I steer away from 2,4-D because I don't think the crop safety is there and it will kill your legume clover if you have that uh, underseeded. Same with Bactro. And I'll use a, a tilt, a full rate of tilt fungicide. 
any half rate of preaxilar at this time or just before. So here's another photo. Um, you're about nine inches to 12 inches tall and I'm out there spraying for weeds in that first pass of fungicide. So plant thick, treat it like a crop, spray, spray fungicide. Uh, second pass of fungicide, which I pulled the photo, uh, it is at flag leaf. So flag leaf is the last leaf before the head comes out. It's the, when the collar fully develops, that's when I'm out spraying. I spray my own. I don't trust the co-op to get it done at the right time. When you spray your own, absolutely make sure that that sprayer is clean. There's zero margin for a dirty sprayer in oak. <coughs> and I say there's zero margin for a dirty sprayer in any crop because I don't want to be the guy that has dead crop. You know what's going to happen right next to the road. And we see it. The booms had something in it. It took off across the field and it killed a few hundred yards. The thing with oats is we are all about test weight on food grade. So if you have herbicide residues, the most likely result is that you're going to damage your test weight. So I'll even use hot water. So I'll, I'll get either hot water out of the house is usually where I get it for that first rinse through the sprayer. If this doesn't make you want to grow oats, nothing will, by the way. Um, so this is a variety called Reins, R-E-I-N-S. Uh, they're a little shorter. Uh, they have a good test weight uh, on average, a little higher than like a saddle, but we've had very good success, success with saddle. Reins and stack saddle seem to stand the best. Uh, the standability beats Rushmore, so they, I'm talking three varieties now. Rushmore would be the third one that I grow a fair amount of. The test weight is highest on the Rushmore, but they are the tallest and leafiest plant and like to lodge. So for weed control, the saddle and Rushmore have an edge, but for standability, rains. Uh, is the best from what I found. So I was clipping along at about five and a half miles an hour with a 20 foot head on a class six combine. It's a nice clean sample, it better be, but it, of course it is because it's a gleaner, so. <laughs> um, and to get a clean sample, and, and, and there's videos out there now, um, Practical Farmers of Iowa did video series, they've done a number of them on growing oats though. Alec and Rachel are in one for uh, crediting clover, but I'll get into that a little bit too. Uh, lots of rotor speed if you need it, tight on the concave if you need it to open it up. There is a point in which in the afternoon you can grind a little too much. Um, so you might have to open up a little bit and slow down as, as the dew lifts, afternoon things get dry. Lot, I use all the wind that the combine has. I want to blow out the lights and the thins. I'll, and and in, in contrast to that, I will close the lower sieve a little tighter than you normally would in oats, so tighter than what the book will say on whatever flavor combine you have. And what that does is it shuts down the lifting air through the shoe and it will maximize your cross blast in the shoe. So Gleaner uses an accelerator roll system. Um, so I want that crosswind at maximum and the lifting air shut down just a little bit by closing that lower sieve down a little more than you normally would. And it also is sending more through the return. So I send a lot through the return. The longer it stays in the combine, actually, the higher test weight the combine is making those oats. It's weird, right? But anytime you work oats, work them, like put them through an auger, send them through a grain leg, you're raising their test weight. Same inside the combine. The more that return to rotor, the higher test weight those are going to get. So at this point, if you grab a sample off that, right, you know, when this photo was taken, and it says 34, 35 pounds test weight, 
carry on. Because from then on, your test weight's only gonna go up. They'll sweat in the bin, they'll come up a point. Run them through, every time you run them through an auger, they'll probably raise a half a point to a point. Running them through a grain cart is gonna raise them about a point. This year, uh, we are delivering our oats that were growing last you know, summer, 2023. We started delivering them uh, in, in our growing group in November, December, and so far the winning test weight was 42.4. We haven't had a delivered load under 38 to this year. So remember, 36 is the minimum, but it, we have bragging rights when we're up to 40 to 42, because those are Canadian test weights. That's my son raking the straw. We do, I have sold all of the straw to this point off the oat acres. I'd like to pull away from that a little bit because every time you remove something from your farm, you have to replace it. Um, when for P and K were at their highest, a ton of, of straw had about $60 of P and K within it. This year it's probably closer and I haven't reworked the math to be honest, but just the, um, reworking the numbers in my head, it's probably around $40 of P and K within that straw per ton. So keep that in mind, but then also keep in mind the carbon that you're removing from your farm and the other benefits that that straw has, such as the micronutrients. So this year, um, this coming harvest, I'll actually have a stripper head, and that may be the time that I stop selling the straw because it's going to stay there standing. Stripper head only takes the grain off the top of the, the top of the plant, which you could understand it uses a lot less fuel in the combine, uses a lot less power, and the harvest efficiency is a lot greater. So stay tuned on a review of Shelbourne Reynolds stripper heads for next year. This is what the legume cover crop looks like. Um, I think this was a saddle oat, but look at how green the bottom of those, of those oat plants, the oat stubble is. Um, it's, it's actually quite green at the bottom of the plant at the time that I start combining. So I will cut as high as possible to make sure that I can keep the combine moving relatively well. And you don't want to end up down in that clover anyway. You don't want to run too much of that through the combine. So that's probably, you know, if you had a ruler out there, that's probably almost a foot of stubble height. This would be, let's just call this August 5th. I don't remember exactly the date on that. This is the exact same field on September 27th. So you can see that red clover, how much that'll grow. Now this is in crop year 2020, so we were not within a drought. This year, this last year in 2023, it was not this tall. Um, but there's a substantial amount of feed out there if you need it. This last year, a lot of the red clover that I grew did go to feed because there was such a shortage of feed in the area. Again, same field. So in this in this photo, the ranger would have been down the hill to the right, just out of just out of the photo here. And this is the next spring. So this is spring 2021, planting corn into that clover. Now I kind of got lulled into this management system of planting green and killing the the clover after I planted immediately, the next day if possible, but immediately. And in summer 2023, I, I followed this program, but I will caution on a drought year, this is very risky. So this year, because remember these drought maps I went back to, right? Like we are still in a drought right now. And in fact, it's worse here in a drought rating than it is at home for me. So this would be a risky scenario this year. And if we don't get more moisture, I would terminate that clover as soon as possible if it's still alive. Most of my clover was terminated at the end of the growing season last year. So 
I was out there spraying middle of October. So most of my clover now is turned <coughs> But if it was a different year, I'd give you different advice. That's what good, uh, when we manage these systems, we always, good farmers will evaluate the position that we're in at all times of the year, right? Um, so this is, I don't have this planner anymore, uh, but the new planner will be set up uh, identically to this. Uh, when it's dry, I will put the 32% down in the ground using a two by two system. I'm actually a little bit further away than two inches because I put 20 gallons of 32% down. So I put about 70 to 75 pounds of nitrogen on with the planter. Most of that's going on right here. I have a Yetter sharp tooth row cleaner. This planter, which I used for many years, did not have any kind of technology as far as down pressure. It had a very basic KPM to monitor. <coughs> but just the point being that you could take an old 7000 series John Deere and probably make it do this. The rules of no-tilling, especially in high residue, are make sure that the seed is down where it belongs in corn that's at least inch and three quarters deep, if not two. Uh, so this is about inch and three quarters to two here. The next rule is make sure there are no there are no pieces of residue down there with that seed. So hair pinning. We don't want to do that. And then the, the last rule is make sure the seed furrow is closed. So leaving the seed furrow open can obviously lead to uh, uneven germination, but it also provides har safe harbor for slugs and other bugs to hide during the sun of the day. So they can sit down in that seed furrow during the heat of the day and the slugs can live down there and they'll go right up and down your open furrows and eat away. So this is an SI finger till closing wheel. They're more on the aggressive side. I am putting a pop-up fertilizer down in with the seed on uh, in furrow when it's wet, which this photo actually was taken uh, two years ago in crop year 2022, and it was wet that spring, I will put my 32% out the back and lift those coulters in the front or just drop them right off. And I made quick connects so I could re-plumb to the back. And the reason I don't want that disturbance up front in a wet year is cavitation and it brings up wet soils in the no-till system and I just want that down. When it's wet, um, I would, can actually plant in this condition before a conventional farmer next door can plant on bare soils because I'll float over the top. All things equal. Check your down pressure, make sure you're not sidewall compacting all those fun things that we need to follow when we want to do a good job planting corn. But you can see here, now I brag about that, it didn't even look like the planter went through there. And that's what it looks like a few weeks later. It is amazing how fast that red clover disappears in the spring because of the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the stubble is much different than that red clover. So that stubble will actually tie up nitrogen. And that's why I want that starter ban. And this should be one of the laws of no-tilling into any cover crop, which is a lot of nitrogen within the starter band of the row because if you broadcast all of your nitrogen and you have this high carbon to nitrogen ratio residue, where's your nitrogen gonna go? Over to this stuff, not into that. And you will get a yield penalty from it. Every year I do some nitrogen trials as time allows. This was just a really nice one and I keep using it as any. Um, same field that that ranger was parked on, same field that the planter photo was taken in right here. Um, 
so we can follow this field all the way to harvest. That's why I like it, because I had all the photos. Um, this field was about a 230, 228 bushel field across the scale. Here's just some yield checks out there. And I did a low planter nitrogen only rate all the way up to basically unlimited nitrogen at 180 pounds. And statistically, year after year, I stopped getting a yield response to nitrogen around 100 pounds to 110 pounds. So I've gotten very comfortable in applying about 100, I put down about 105 to 110 pounds of nitrogen on my corn ground following, uh, following small grains. I do side dress a little bit periodically uh, depending on the situation because I picked up more ground, I uh, had some strips I wanted to get straightened out so it was easier to farm so I'll, I, I do like that side dressing. Uh, this year I'm actually going to pull back my nitrogen I put on with the planter, not really by choice, it's just when I went to a 16 row planter I don't want to carry as much on the planter. So I'll probably, probably go back to side dressing, but on the early side. So that was more of a, the reasons for that changing wasn't um, what I've got, uh, what I really believe in, it's just trying to get the work done. I know Alec and Rachel tried this a few years ago. I tried it last year. I couldn't have picked a worse year to try doing this, which is following the small grains with buckwheat. That buckwheat never got a rain on it <coughs> since the day it was no-till. So the day I, uh, the, I planted it was my opening cover photo, right? So no-tilling that buckwheat into the, into the oat, oat stubble. And this was probably, I don't know, September 15th, which you got to give it credit. I mean, it was the little buckwheat that could. <laughs> but... Um, I, I did not, I, I gave up on it after it never got a rain on it, and I didn't spray the volunteer oats out. Uh, but the neighbors talked about how that whole 60 acres blossomed white. And what the neighbors, you know, think of us as farmers, they say, well, okay, but the neighboring farmers think of me, eh, I guess I've never really cared about that. But because I'm so close to Rochester, I do care about what the residents of Rochester and the non-farming community sees. So when they see flowers, that is an excellent result, regardless how you cut it. Now, you say it's great for the pollinators. Well, it is, and that's what we should be doing, because we're stewards. But then it's also great for the community. And uh, I, I planted a acre of sunflowers because I did an enhancement with CSP, um, which was brought up earlier. And the amount of people that stop and go out there and take photos in the sunflowers, you say, if we could do that as an ag agriculture community across the board, that's how we uh, move forward as a farming community. So. I didn't get buckwheat, long story short. I didn't get buckwheat to grain. I'm not going to give up on it. I'm going to try it again because I, especially if we can get out there and get our oats planted early this year, not this month, March 1st, <laughs> then you get the approval to go plant oats. Um, um, chances are I'm going to get the oats off early and give this another, another go at it because then I have the, the economics of the oat crop and the about the 35 cents a bushel, or sorry, a pound on the buckwheat. So it just adds to the bottom line. So I'm gonna go into my spreadsheet. Some of you remember it from last year, I'm sure. I'm gonna bring it back up and I'm gonna re revisit this of how it looks this year. And it's, um, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Pretty sure I said that last year. It's kind of hard to see on the smaller screen, so I'm going to zoom in. And the way that I build this spreadsheet is you can see the two headings there, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, 550 acres divided into two crops <coughs> on the left-hand side. 
So, or sorry, 1,100 acres divided into two crops on the left-hand side, 1,100 acres divided into three crops on the right-hand side. So if I was just a corn and soybean farmer, I'd have 550 acres of each, right? So what's, uh, that's pretty close to my average land cost at home, but what's an average land cost down here? I have 250. 270, I heard? My APHs are really close to 60 and 200. They're a little bit under that now. Is that fair? Do we go a little higher or a little lower? Are we going to leave it the same? We can leave it the same. Okay. Average market price on soybeans I have is 11.55. I think that was a week or two ago. And on corn I had 4.27. So this is new crop 2024. We're comfortable with leaving it there. I love trying to get farmers to be involved. <laughs> okay, so up on the left hand side here, you know, if we, if we grew that, that's what we'd be returning revenue 60 bushel beans, 200 bushel corn, sold them for those prices. And then we go down to our seed cost, our fertilizer cost, our application cost, pesticide cost, all of that are in there. Right? So it's a, it's a middle of the road management system. Because <coughs> we're all probably familiar with high management systems where all of our agronomists try to talk us into that. So I have about $177 on the soybean side, $400 on the corn side, outside of equipment and land costs. So here's our equipment and land costs. So at the, at the very end, we would have about $575 in our soybean crop this year. <coughs> yep, and $864 in our corn crop this year. Does it sound about right for you guys? Because we can adjust it as needed. We would make, make a whopping $10, uh, sorry, we would lose $10 an acre on corn, but soybeans still look okay. We can make some, some money on soybeans this year at $115 an acre profit on the soybean side. Which actually, that surprised me. I thought it would look less favorable even on the soybean side. We're investing about $793,000 on 1,100 acres to do that. Now we could break that into you know, okay, what's depreciation, what's actual cash, what's diesel fuel, right? But I challenge you to work through your own numbers. On the equipment cost, I'll usually pick the middle of the road on the Iowa State Custom Rate Survey. And the reason that I do that is if I wasn't in that tractor, planting, whatever, like I need to make money for myself to buy food, to pay for my housing, to get Rudy to go to school, et cetera, right? So our time is worth something, right? Always, always build that into our spreadsheet. I know we all want to farm and keep farming, but our time is worth something. Because if you weren't farming, you could do something else that maybe is enjoyable as farming. Probably not. So same 1,100 acres, we're going to divide it into three on the right-hand side. Right here, to start with, I'm going to have 0% rotational advantage. So I'm going to be really <clears throat> pessimistic. Which, is, this is not realistic, because Dean, what do you think rotational advantage is for? 7-9%. Uh, 7-9%. We're going to return to that. No cost share in this system on anything. Uh, my APH on oats are just really close to 120 now. Five bucks looks fairly close to where we may end up, and I could get into marketing on oats. Uh, but the thing coming out of last year is we're really tight on ending stocks because there was a drought and because there was a huge reduction in planted oat acres going into last year. 
If you sold your straw and deducted all of the expenses for the straw, because I didn't want to make this too complicated, you could return about 50 bucks an acre on your straw. You could probably do better than that, but I'm being a little pessimistic. Right here on the corn side of things, the seed is less than the seed on the two crop rotation because you will not have extended diapause issue on, on corn rootworm. So I do not use corn rootworm, rootworm traits anymore on my three crop rotation ground. Right here, this $108.53 is about $40 less on fertilizer cost than over on the two crop rotation because I am crediting my legume cover crop. So this year it's about 30 bucks less. Last year it was $40 less. Um, there's the cost of the legume cover crop over here, 45 bucks seed cost on oats. So you have about $200 an acre on, on oats outside of land and, and uh, equipment costs. We're gonna go down. So the bottom line on the oats there is you, if you invest about $576 an acre. Now these are my numbers, and the reason that they're high is because I put a lot of fertilizer on the ground that my oats went on this year. It just happened to be that way because I have a pretty aggressive P and K program on land that I own, or that's family owned. Um, so I have a pretty high P and K cost, so keep that in mind, right? So we could rebuild this to fit more of our 30, 30, 30, which would be the recommended application rate for oats. But this is real life. This is how I want to manage my farm so that I have fertility for the long run. So I'm making about $75 an acre on oats. Again, we're not including the 79% rotational advantage on corn and soybeans because we're going to be, we're going to go in this like Scrooge. This is the bottom line of the whole farm over here on the right hand side. Right over here on this far left hand side, that's the bottom line on the corn and soybeans. So if you took all your acres, you went left and you went vertical and horizontal and you figured out your bottom line, what could I kind of count on for, for net profit on my 1,100 acres if I marketed my grain as such and grew that yield. You'd be making about $58,000 over on the, on the two crop side and on our three crop side you're making about 80 grand. So that's a difference of $21,000 more on the three crop rotation. And how much money did it take to get more? So how much are we investing to return that $20,000 more? We're actually investing $66,000 less on 1,100 acres. And what's the cost of money this year? 7%, 8%, that's not built into this spreadsheet. <coughs> Most of that is coming from the oat year in this case where we're actually returning more money than corn because remember on corn over on the other side we were losing 10 bucks an acre and we're actually returning a little bit of profit on corn over here because we reduced our costs. Now if we want to make this a little more realistic and we're going to put in 7% rotational effect. So that gets us about four bushels on soybeans and about 14 on corn. And soybeans, I'll argue this up and down all day long because soybeans don't like other soybean crop years, <coughs> predominantly because of root diseases. Now we're really moving that, for, that needle forward. Now we got $60,000 more money out of our farm this year than doing a two crop rotation. We could throw in our available cost share, 
there's cost share available on oats if you piggyback everything with the cover crops and that you probably could get you know I'm going to be middle of the road 50 bucks an acre even over all of those acres you got 20 from PFI you could do your nitrogen reduction cost share for the next year you could cost share your your legume cover crop programs X Y Z right A through Z maybe this is the warrant that I always leave my computer unplugged because about this time is when it says the batteries are running low and it's like, oh, it's about time to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here on, on, when we put some cost share in on the old side, you know, we're at the 125 bucks an acre uh, on, the, on the revenue of the oats, on the, sorry, on the profit of the oats. Dean, do you want me to build it? A little pessimistic on the oat price and show if like if you broke even on oats. What's your price up there right now? I can't Five bucks. I go to four and a quarter. Okay. That's what Green Board is bidding right now. And we're gonna pull the cost share back out. Because I kinda wanna show a bare minimum profit on oats. So here we're only returning 35 bucks on oats. <coughs> we're still as a farm making $44,000 a year more, and we're, we're investing $64,000 less in that farm. So I would, any way in any crop that you're farming, I would challenge you to do your break even sheets this way. So whether you have livestock, whether it's hogs, I build this hog barn, or I have these feeder cattle. The manure is worth this. The relationship is worth that. Because that's actually how our farms are functioning. Everyone asks me, because we have this oak growing group of about 43 farmers this year, 44, about 4,000 acres. And when they first come to me and say, well, what am I going to make on that oat year? I'll never just show them the oat ear. You could and still make a good argument for it, but it's not just about the oat ear when you put a small grains out on a farm. And I remember this like six, seven years ago. Like, gosh, I wish there was another crop you could grow. And, and, and I wanted it because, well, back in the day, in the 80s, when dad had all that hay and all those small grains, like we didn't have this issue or that issue, or where even, you know, all along, where is the best corn year after year when you have hay in rotation? It's the corn you grow after your hay crop. That's, I mean, we could, that always happens. You can no-till it in, you can plow it, whatever you want to do, that's where your best corn's going to be. And uh, we're getting a little bit of that back when we can put a third crop into rotation or a fourth or a fifth, ideally. So any questions or thoughts on oats, small grains? Yeah. How do you decide how much and you put on your oats, you put and on, do you have a set rate or a Yep, so pretty much a set rate. On soybean stubble, 30 pounds, 40 pounds is a good rate um, on our soil types. On heavier uh, soil types, you could probably go up a little bit, but I, you know, the, the better fertility, the more careful you have to be on that too, because it's a relationship of fertility. So if you have a history of manure, and that if you put 30 pounds on a field with history of manure, regardless where that manure is coming from, you could overgrow the height of your oats and you could end up with oats this tall, right? So then you would be on the lesser 25, 30 pounds. Um, on corn stalks, which I would, that would be a last resort. You can do it, but you're probably shaving off your top end yield by putting oats on corn ground. <clears throat> Better if the corn stover has been removed, either because you chopped it or took the bales off. Um, 
if you're going to no-till it, you don't have a lot of acres, half rate the drill and plant it twice. You know, something like that. Apart from that, on that nitrogen rate, you could be up around 50 pounds. And I know folks have pushed those nitrogen rates and actually um, sprayed like a palisade, which would be a growth regulator to shorten the internoding of the small grains. But I just, to me and what information I've seen, I don't see the payoff on it. So I've seen very good oats growing on 30 pounds of nitrogen, meaning like 140 to 150 bushel oats. So, yeah. Besides planting date and variety, what are some other ways to raise the test weight on oats? Um, so a lot has to do with the combine and how it's set. It, set. So you have, you're right, so you have the, the agronomics, you get uh, variety, Seeding rate actually matters on test weight because um, you want one stem, less tillers supporting that one seed head, and that seems to be a test weight assurance relationship there. That's why we're seeding heavier than we used to, like a two bushel. And then, you know, so we're okay, we're spraying twice. Once, um, absolutely once, but twice if you can do it. Um, and then our combine settings with lots of wind to blow out the lights, and there might end up to be your cover crop. You know, they kind of mix in with the red clover, and that's fine. You know, uh, you just don't want them in your sample. Okay, so now they they are in your sample, or some weather challenge occurred, something happened during the growing season that you still have 34 pound oats. Move, start moving them around. If you don't have anything else. So we all pretty much have augers or whatever, start moving them around. Windy day, raise the auger up too high. Load the semi on a windy day. You'd be surprised how much that actually helps. Okay, if that still fails, you have option, run it through a grain vac. A grain vac will raise it a couple pounds one time through because of the collision of the oats inside of the grain vac and then the air movement actually um, removing some of that chaff will raise the test weight. There's actually a couple more options. Send them through a grain leg into an empty bin. Slam them on the floor of a bin through a 100-foot grain leg. Uh, a GT batch dryer. Let them sit in there and run away because they'll go up through the center auger and back down. And the last and final option would be to run them through a grain cleaner if you had to. But you see that, and I didn't know any of this when I started raising oats. I'm like, well, what, it was all about the test weight. If you don't hit test weight, you got, excuse me, but crap, you can't sell it. Um, but there are ways to salvage a crop. It would have to be pretty catastrophic to not have a salvageable oat crop. And that's how the grain elevators, to be honest, used to make money on oats, is they'd buy light oats, blend it with heavy oats, move them around uh, to the point that they got them heavy enough to mill it. Are uh, the two fungicide passes for disease control or plant health? Uh, well, both, but disease, disease control, uh, predominantly rust. Um, one thing I didn't hit on, but also is a big uh, dinger of test weights, uh, for lack of better words, is herbicide carryover, particularly pursuit. So if you have pursuit on the farm on the soybean grown, I kind of steer clear till you got that out of your herbicide uh, docket. On corn, it's becoming more popular to put uh, atrazine back in the blend particularly to help out like our, our uh, Laudises and Callistos, Halix GTs. That's another bad one um, to not have. So that'd be if you were putting oats prior to, or sorry, after corn stalks. So um, herbicide is a big thing. Watch your herbicides when you have your field selection, particularly pursuit. Because that, that was known for you to have this beautiful looking <coughs> field of oats in the test way, it just wasn't there.
and Jen is raising her hand because uh, she is part of Tree Range Farms and their nonprofit wing uh, runs, owns the chicken processing plant in Stacyville. So a friend of mine grew up with him, raised chickens, number of them on the farm. Now they have their farm system through Tree Range Farms, but even if you're raising broilers on your farm, and I've butchered a lot of chickens in my life, and to be honest, pay them the five bucks, run them to Stacyville, have them process them. <laughs> so a selfless plug to the Stacyville processing plant. It's on the north side up there by the, should be just east of the uh, ready mix plant. I think there's a ready mix plant up there. So. It's nonprofit owned, so I feel okay putting a plug in for it. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's did you see how Rachel helped? I mean, oh. I, I needed the help. <laughs> you can okay. use this one. <laughs> Give Warren a hand. Are you guys been around a while, Martin? Yeah. Okay. If you have any other questions, don't be afraid to get a hold of him and ask him because it's, this is the time to ask those questions. I'm glad he uh, talked a little bit about herbicide because that's the first thing when someone asks if they could start to plant oats or raise oats. What did I say, Justin? What was the herbicide? What was the herbicide program from last year? And even probably two or three years prior to that, because I remember when I was a kid, we used to use a lot of atrazine. And I'm not gonna tell you what rates we used to use, because they were very illegal right today. But there were times when we had to wait three to four years after using atrazine before oats would even grow. And I think like what um, Martin said, that, that will hurt our testimony even if we do get them to grow. So I'm not going to talk anymore now, we're going to talk afterwards. So I want to bring up Mervyn Beachy. He's going to lead us in prayer before we start. And he furnished the hamburgers today that he raises on his farm. And I don't know, how do you market a money pretty good? Free range? Um, how do you do that? Or, all natural, grass fed, all natural. All natural grass fed, awesome. Okay, so if everybody would, wherever you want to come up, please. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessings to us. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to look into the things of, of being good stewards of, of your earth. Pray, Lord, that you would bless each one here, bless us as we take of the food, pray that it would nourish our bodies, and may we use the strength from it to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Robin. All right, exit back. The food is ready, so have at it. We'll take about an hour, maybe a little bit less than an hour break, so we'll see you when you get back.